Welcome to another edition of Athletes Wisdom Podcast. I am your host and creator, Alexander Turner, and here on this podcast, we talk about business, marketing, and financial literacy as a college athlete, and how you could actually take these steps and these tools and implement them into your own life, into your own business, and into your own brand, so you can start making money inside and outside of NIL. <laughs> Today, I have an amazing, amazing guest. This amazing guy right here is a guru when it comes to financial literacy. He has dabbled and dabbled in many, many areas such as real estate, standing credit, and so, so much more. So make sure you grab your pen and your paper because note takers are money makers and note takers are game changers, all right? Today, I have an amazing, amazing guest, Robin Herndon. Did I pronounce your name, your last name right? You did it right, brother. <laughs> so, Robin, go ahead and let the audience know who you are. And if they aren't familiar with you, go ahead and let them know where they can follow you right now. Appreciate it, Alex. Yeah, yes, Robin, Robin Herndon, the real estate professional. Uh, Robin's your way. We're giving you the game. Uh, you can find myself on social media. You can find me on TikTok. You can find me on YouTube, Facebook, all those platforms. I am here to give you guys a game. I love it. I love it. So for those who are not familiar with who you are, can you just give like a quick like minute or two intro about kind of how you started off on this financial literacy journey, whether that's, you know, through real estate, whether that's through the other various things that you do? Absolutely. Well, originally I planned on playing ball, you know, for the NFL. And, uh, you know, I was great in high school. I had a scholarship. I was on my way to USC, and then I planned on playing for uh, San Francisco 49ers, and then uh, I ended up blowing it. I wasn't going to get rich quick that way, so to speak, and when I realized that I wasn't going to be able to follow you know, that path and that journey to success, you know, I had to kind of uh, hunker down, so to speak, and figure out how I was still going to be able to sustain myself and reach those goals of attaining financial freedom. And so I started looking into like, who's going to make the most money in the world? Who did that at the time? And I found out that it was like attorneys, it was doctors, and then it was real estate professionals. And, and so when I looked at how long it was going to take uh, to get those certifications, you know, attorneys and doctors, you had eight years of school. I was like, that's out. I ain't going to do that. And then when I looked into being a real estate professional at the time, it was like, all you needed to have was like two, three months you get your certification and then you can work your way to get a real estate license. And so I'm like, they make a lot of money and all you got to do is go to school for two or three months. And then that was it. I said, all right, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into that. And so I jumped into real estate and I started the whole professional focus of how I'm going to be able to attain financial freedom through real estate and literacy and how that situation works. And so that was my journey into real estate. And then it led into many other things. So I can kind of go on and on, but I don't want to get off task. You no, know, you're good. You're good. So let's just touch on a couple of like, give me two of what those other things are that you just said that they've led into some other things, just so the audience can get a better understanding of the vast knowledge that you know and where some of your expertise may lie. Sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, in real estate. You know, when you're like a real estate agent and you're acting on behalf of uh, sellers that when they're trying to sell their home or buyers who's trying to buy real estate, you know, it was pretty compelling. And I was, you know, in my early 20s and I didn't have the best of credit because I had messed up. I didn't get taught that credit was so important. And it was the way that I'll be able to tame home ownership if I wasn't already wealthy to buy everything cash. And so then it kind of led into me trying to figure out how do I position myself credit wise to be able to qualify for financing. Or when I was trying to get a new car at that time, it was like credit became a thing too. Or if I wanted to get a credit card, credit became a thing too. So it was like, it was knocking at my door. Like credit is a big thing. And so I went on that journey of trying to figure out how to fix my credit. And then those that were already in the real estate industry that I was running into they started referring me to people that had either credit repair organizations or before you know it, I found that there was attorneys that was helping people uh, repair and understand how to adjust their credit. And so that led into me getting that literacy and understanding how to position myself and my family in a way of credit. And before you know it, I was like, I'm paying so much money. I'm referring business to people that have credit repair organizations. 
I was like, you know, that's a nice little side hustle. And then I took it on myself and I turned it into a business. And so credit became part of my business in addition to real estate. And then it became how to structure myself in a way of like business, how I would be able to qualify uh, to be an investor, uh, to be able to have the proper structure. And then I started getting into, you know, corporation services, you know, how to form and structure a corporation or LLC and a business. That way I'll be able to get the best tax benefits, be able to buy real estate, you know, have leverage and then to reduce my liabilities personally. So uh, those were the other things in addition to some other things, but it, it led down that path like credit and business structure outside of real estate. Gotcha. And I want to ask a quick question. This is something that you uh, spoke on earlier about essentially you had this dream, you had this plan, you had this goal to uh, go to USC and then go to the 49ers and play. What stopped that and what advice can you give to a college athlete as far as making sure you have a secondary skill to fall back on, right? And I don't like saying backup plan because I don't want to make it seem as if that you should have a backup plan because your first plan is going to fail. No, I I want you to gear it in the sense of what's that secondary skill they can have simply because even if you do end up making it to the pros, you're only going to be in the pros for so long. You still need something to do afterwards. Right? So kind of go ahead and touch on that a little bit. Sure. Sure. Yeah. You know, when I realized that I wasn't going to the NFL, this was, you know, like my 12th grade year, I had already kind of blew the scholarship. And then in order for me to continue and I wasn't going to go to a four year university, I, I tapped into like a community college and I wanted to play ball there. I ended up having to realize in my situation, I ended up having a child too at the age of 18 years old. So I had to kind of balance and I had to choose, you know, whether I was going to go all back in on trying to focus on that career. And since the reason I blew my scholarship, it wasn't going to happen at USC. I'm like, I can go to the community college, show my skill set, and then I work my way up there to, to meet that dream that I originally had. But again, having a child and then needing work and have to provide for that child, it became I had to do the whole nine to five thing. And that, that nine to five thing, it was going to be a challenge for me to be able to go to practice and do all that at the same token, be able to take care of the family or take care of my son at the time. And so I had to choose. I had to make that sacrifice. It, it made it to where going into the nine to five situation, I'm like, I don't want to stay in this nine to five situation. I need more money. You know, I just had that mindset that I needed more money. And so then it, it required for me after hours to educate myself on how I can be successful and still attain that financial freedom, so to speak. And again, they kind of led into me looking at like what professions I was going to be able to accomplish this through outside of this nine to five industry. And again, it led into real estate. And so I realized that education was the key. You know, if I hadn't set aside the time to look into what was going to help me to attain my financial freedom, I wasn't going to be able to achieve it. So my recommendation is just educating oneself on how they can have financial freedom. And if you don't have the education, it's going to be hard for anybody. I don't care if they're already made it. You know, they're that athlete that has scale. When you're looking at contracts, you need to understand things. When you are investing because you already got leverage, you need to understand the do's and don'ts of business. And business literacy is so crucial in order for one to succeed. Even if your attorneys are giving you contracts, you need to understand what you're dealing with there. So hopefully that helps, you know, and if that touches on what you asked of me. But yeah, I think literacy is so important. And that's what led to myself having such success. And the education is everything. You want to have literacy, if anything, to fall back on how to be able to continue and be successful. Exactly. And I like how you said like literacy and the education aspect, right? Because oftentimes, and I had this mindset a little bit when I first was out of school, but oftentimes, right, we're in school for so long, for most of basically all of our lives. And when we we finally get out or when we're finally in college, we're like, whoo, finally, like not as much school or more relaxed. And honestly, you have to always be in a mind state of learning, a mind state of education, especially outside of school, right? Because like you said, having that business literacy, just understanding important financial literacy will help you a long way, regardless of whether you want to create a secondary skill in a financial literacy space, right? Just understanding how it works, because nine times out of 10, what I've seen is college athletes and athletes in general, 
right? They tend to not want to work for somebody else after they get out of sports, right? They've had that spotlight, that glamour, that fame in a sense, right? So they, it, just in their mindset, they're like, I don't want to go, I don't want to leave here and then go into working for somebody, right? So they end up trying to start their own business, but they try to start their own business without all the necessary years and of studying and learning and experience. Even if it's not years, they don't even really take the time just to learn the basics, right? I do like the fact that you touched on an understanding business literacy, understanding financial literacy, being able to set yourself up to where no matter what you end up doing, whether you end up doing real estate, right? Whether you end up doing insurance, whether you end up starting your own clothing brand or whatever business that you're going to start, you still need those basic necessary tools in order to understand how to maneuver that properly. And I like how you also touched on the contracts because far too often we see athletes, both men and women on the professional level, years later, they find out that contracts weren't structured properly for them, but they don't understand the ins and outs and the languages of what's in those contracts. And they end up, you know, getting the short end of the stick. And they're like, or artists are a perfect example as well, because it's still the entertainment industry. We always see this artist who blew up overnight, overnight, quote unquote, right? They're like a instant success. And then when they finally get a record deal, right, all of a sudden they don't really make as much music and they feel trapped because they weren't paying attention to their contract and what the actual words were saying. I feel like this is a perfect pivot into choosing also your proper circle, right? Making sure that you have a team and friends around you that are helping you make the right decisions. But how in business has finding the right team and the right circle helped you? And how can a college athlete start setting themselves up to find the right people? Like what are certain things they need to look for in the right people that need to be in their circle? Yeah, good question. I think that, you know, you, you want to look into those who are actually successfully in doing what they're doing. You know, like right now we have social media out there. You know, you can go online, you can research people, whether there's attorneys or whether there's, you know, so-called gurus or, and, and whatever profession it is that you're interested in, you want to look and to see how active they are and, you know, how successful they actually are. And then you want to peer into those who actually can show that they actually are successful. And I know for myself, I look and I research into people that are very influential, you know, in the market, whether it's in real estate whether it's uh, the legal side of the world or even in business. And I look at their followers, I follow exactly what they're doing. And what I normally do is I invest into myself and I invest into them to be able to size them up to see whether or not what they're saying is true. And I, I can just give you an example. I'm into the, the multifamily space and there's there's a gentleman out there <clears throat> that's killing in real estate and uh, his name is Grant Cardone. And so I've been seeing what he's been doing for years. I decided like, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and throw some money into Grant Cardone and I take on his career curriculum. And then doing so, uh, there's been a wealth of information that stemmed from it. And so, you know, I can see that he was actively, you know, practicing what he was preaching. And then I actually invested into like the curriculum. And then that in itself has had a, a lasting effect on my myself and my business. And it's applied to even when it comes down to like marketing, I'm looking to see who's the person that's killing it in a marketing. And I remember a guy that was killing it out here. A lot of people knew who he was. His name was Billy Jean. And so I tapped into Billy Jean is marketing. And then when I tapped in with him, it was the same concept. And I seen what he was doing. And, you know, now I can go ahead and hit the guy up on, on the phone, so to speak. So I think you have to surround yourself with people that are in the industry that you are interested in either investing into or having that as like a plan B. Follow them, research them, discern whether or not what they said is true. And don't hesitate on investing into yourself, jumping into their curriculum. And then that way you'll have that insight and you'll be able to implement it into your business. Hopefully that answers your question, you know? It definitely did. It definitely did. Because like you said, in order to surround yourself around people, even if they're not even necessarily building on your team as of right now, right? I've learned just from being in high level business mentorships is that if you want to be like a certain person, right? You need to hang around those type of people, right? So if you're trying to become a successful entrepreneur, then you should hang around successful entrepreneurs and eventually they will become part of your team, your family, your friend group, whatever the case is, as long as you continuously put yourselves in those rooms and in those environments. Same well, thing goes with professional athlete, right? Hang around professional athletes, see the type of work ethic they do, see the type of regular routines they do, so on and so forth. So it does make sense, right? But mm -hmm. when it comes to building your friend group and understanding the right people to add into your life, right? I think it's, a, it's important to note that you could very well be hanging around people who might seem as if they're good for you, but truly they're a leech that's honestly in it for the ride, right? They're in 
in it to basically ride your success and, you know, basically take from you. And I feel like that's very important, especially for athletes, because of the industry they're in. That can happen so much more frequently. And I think that people need to be, athletes need to be a bit more mindful on who they actually uh, decide to let in their circle. If I may say, I was thinking about that. You know, I think, like, I know for myself, outside of the fam, you know, I got some childhood friends that I can say they're just an associate, someone that I've known, but their actions speaks louder than words. I don't sit at the table with them per se throughout the weeks or monthly because they have different interests than I do. So if they were on the same level, then we would be sitting at the table having conversations about the things that I'm currently interested in. And then for the most part, it's either business or the family or investments. And it's hard for those persons to have those type of conversations if that's not what they're about. So normally, you know, I remember my grandmother will always say water finds its level and it becomes that you surround yourself around people that are actually, you know, into what you're into. You're going to see that within their actions, you know, so eventually people fade away if they're not doing the same type of things that you're doing and they're truly not a compliment to what you're doing. So if you're an athlete, you know, when you go to practice, you know, these same cats are at practice, so to speak. You know, you guys have that level of interest, but outside of that or what's their conversation about? What kind of business moves are they making to set themselves up or their family? So I, I totally agree with you there. Your association, you know, they is you are who you associate with, your so to speak. Is your net worth, essentially. Yep. Right? And yep. I like that you said that it's like, what conversations are they having outside of practice, right? Because one of my mentors says, what you tune into, you turn into and what entertains you, trains you, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know that the people that you're hanging around in practice, when you're in practice, it's all about sports, this, sports, that, you know, whatever the game is, whatever sport you're playing, right? Whether it's football, basketball, baseball, gymnastics, whatever. But mm -hmm. you need to be having those high-level conversations off the court as well. And I feel like LeBron is a perfect example of that. He is mm -hmm. honestly the epitome of not only surrounding himself with the right people, but also making the right financial decisions with those people, those people making smart business moves that not only benefit obviously themselves, but benefit many other people as well that they essentially reach out to and help. So I feel like this is a perfect pivot to ask you, right? Because you are a former athlete, what are some beginner financial advices that you wish you knew essentially when you were say, you know, 18 years old, either, you know, just about to go in college or, you know, say a freshman or a sophomore, anybody who's in college right now, right? Who's essentially looking to start learning financial literacy, who's looking to start their own business. What's one major biggest key of financial literacy advice or business literacy advice that you can give them? I would say you have to peer into, you know, literacy is everything. You got the libraries, you know, you got Barnes and Noble, but you know, when you're in college, or you're playing sports or that room is available to you to go educate yourself. And so, you know, what are you feeding your, your brain with in a way of education? And if you plan on running a business or operating a business, you know, outside of that career or in addition to that career of playing sports, how are you going to be able to successfully do so? Not unless you have that insight and that awareness. And then that's where you have to tap into those books and understand the fundamentals, whether it's the fundamentals of business. At some point, credit is going to be a thing. You know, you need to understand that and then leverage, you know, that financial literacy, how to starve and stack or how not to live beyond your means. I have many books that are like that, but I will highly recommend like the community hubs within one's community that's helping one structure themselves and position themselves towards success. You have to immerse yourself into some sort of community hub that's about that life, so to speak, or that's about that business, just about being successful, you know, outside of it. And they, they have to have it. They have to have it, whether it's in a college setting or within a local community. So again, that's still geared towards educating oneself and see the books or go to a community hub that's talking about structuring oneself for success you know thereafter if that makes sense it does it does so i'm gonna pivot a little bit here right and i like that you also said you know just the education aspect because that's honestly the biggest thing no matter what you do in life but especially when starting your own business you need to know what you're doing in your business and what to look for and obviously what not to do as well like i said i'm gonna pivot a bit here and i want to ask what are some of the legal things that a college athlete needs to know when starting their own business right because as we know as entrepreneurs right there are a lot of things that when it comes to business that we need to learn we need to understand 
understand. We need to study. But there are certain legal things that I feel like oftentimes aren't even talked about within entrepreneurs, right? Between us, there are certain things that we either don't know or don't think to know unless it's too late. So what would be like one of the major key legal considerations that somebody should probably pay attention to when starting their business or if they already have their business, continuing their business, things like that. And I know you're not a lawyer, so I want to make that clear to everybody. This is not legal advice. This is just something from an entrepreneur from his own experience. Right. So every time you form a new business, you have a state level and you know they have like a, a business license based off of the city that you're in you can go to you know the city's clerk's office and start a dba but like most things there's levels to it you have the, the city level and then you have the state level so uh legally speaking when you form whether it's a, a inc or a llc that's the appropriate structure that you want to have on a state level and then it goes a step further to where you want to make sure that the legal formation or all the documents, you have them intact properly because you can start, you know, articles of organization on a state level. But there's other things you need to have. You know, you got to have your, your your EIN number or you got to have, you know, your, your operating agreement. Um, so having the proper structure. Right. You need to make sure you have that. And there's a lot of attorneys out there that can help one uh, make sure that they have the proper structure and that that proper structure is going to serve as a protection for them to make sure that if they do have any assets and they want to, you know, transfer, you know, assets underneath these entities or underneath trusts and things of that sort, you got to do it the legal way. You got to do it with an attorney's professional manner of doing so in order that way those structures can't be pierced or, you know, you can't lose out on your assets because, you know, of lawsuits and things. And so, again, when you start in a business, you want to make sure you have that proper structure, you know, from A to Z. And I highly recommend, you know, you seek counsel to make sure that you have that proper structure in place, just in a way of starting your own business. I like that you said that, right? Because for one, I want to circle back to the EIN number. For those who do not know what an EIN number is, it's basically your social security number for your business, right? And then you also said having an operating agreement and having all of these things in if you don't know what these things are, right? And we understand that as college athletes, as college students, you might not have all the necessary financial means to hire a lawyer or to pay somebody to do these things, right? But the good thing about the society that we live in now, until you do have those financial requirements that are necessary to, to hire these people, you have a lot of free tools and free resources, whether it's YouTube or like what Robin said earlier and when it comes to doing your research, right? It's not just important to do research on your competitors. It's also important to do research and educate yourself on other aspects of your business, like let's say the legal side, right? Because like I said earlier, you might not necessarily have the funds right now to hire somebody to look at everything and make sure everything's the way it needs to be. But you do have the resources of either researching and finding some lawyers, right, who are in that space, just paying attention to some of the free information and advice that they give so you can properly structure your business, right? Or properly structure any agreements or, you know, how to get EIN number, whatever the case is, right? There's a lot of free resources and free tools out there that you can use now, even if you don't necessarily have the financial resources to hire somebody. And of course, later down the line, when you do, you still definitely want to make sure you actually hire a professional because that's what they do, right? Just like you play at a high level at your sport and that's what you do, right? Of course, somebody can do research on how to do it and this, that, and the third, but they still might not be able to do it the way you do. And that goes to same thing on anything in business, not just legal, right? You may be able to do research and, and find the necessary tools. And yeah, you helped yourself a little bit, but don't just think that you can do everything by yourself because this loops back around to what we said as far as having a team. LeBron didn't make it to where he is just by himself. Yes, he has the amazing talent. He has the amazing mental prowess. The list can go on, right? But he was able to get to where he is now with a team and doing research even before he had certain members on those teams. So he knew who to hire and who to get when he finally did build his team. All right. So I feel like this is a perfect uh, segue into how can college athletes actually start networking, right? Networking to build that relationship, because honestly, everything in life is, is about relationships, right? Whether it's a business, whether it's personal, whether, uh, you know, it's a mixture of the two, everything stems down to relationships. But at the same time, a lot of those relationships come from networking. It's 
slightly different, you know, than just hanging out and talking to your friends or trying to get to know somebody, right? And or not a lot of college athletes have probably been in a networking style environment or a networking style situation to where they really had to, or if they have been, they probably weren't taught those necessary skills on how to network. So what would be some tips that you can give an athlete on networking and maybe even how to get in certain rooms with certain people to network? You know, you got Google, you can Google network groups and they'll come up. I know for, you know, my firm, we like to consider ourselves a community hub and be a resource center to support you know, one's growth in their business structure and small business endeavors. And so we kind of peer into what's going on on a state level, and then we do it from state to state. And we're doing it in a way of educating ourselves and then, you know, distributing it to the public. You know, again, we may go into Google and we look up networking groups that can be for a local community or city and state. And then we'll jump into those networking groups. Let's just say like the Chamber of Cumbers. Right. Chamber of Cumbers are normally, you know, for the city that you're in and all small businesses, for the most part, they get registered at the Chamber of Cumbers uh, for that city. Right. And you can register into that Chamber of Cumbers and you're going to find there that you got attorneys there. You might have, you know, people that does home type services, electrician type work, or you might have your, your local realtors, or you might have your escrow officers. Like, And these are mature persons. These are adults. You know, These are not people that are just high school people. You know, These are people that are actually running and operating a business, and they're focusing on growing their network. And so they're into these local community hubs like the Chamber of Cumbers. So again, you can Google that and you'll, you'll find these different networking groups. And then again, you can reference back and ask like a local community hub that you, you know, you peered into and like, what do you guys think about this? And it's just inevitable. Once you go down that journey of research and, and finding those community hubs or you're Googling and you're, you're joining places like the Chamber of Commerce, and then that wealth of education comes with, and then you're able to start growing your network. Exactly. And I'll, and I'll say one, I'll give one tip to college athletes or anyone who's listening or hasn't properly networked, I'll give you one tip on networking. I wish I knew this when I first started networking and getting inside these rooms, right? This is not a club. This is not a party setting. This is not a setting where, you know, it's a guy trying to talk to a girl and you might get rejected. So you don't want to walk up there. It's not that type of setting, right? When you're in a professional setting, when you're in a setting where people are business minded and they're networking, 99 times out of 100, that person is willing to talk to you, right? whether it's to help you with something or whether it's to maybe learn something from you, right? So don't be afraid to reach out. The easiest thing that you can say a great conversation starter is, how you doing? My name is whatever. It's it's literally that simple, right? Because like I said, this is not that party club setting. This isn't an environment where people might not want to talk. When people are networking, when people are in that business mindset, like you said, Robin, people are trying to grow their network because your network is your net worth. You literally need to just Take the initiative, just take that step and say, hey, I am so-and-so. Even if you're still in school and you feel as if you might not necessarily have a lot to provide, right? Because generally when you're networking, you want to be able to be of value to someone. But at the same time, we have all been in a position where we can't be as valuable to someone as they possibly can to us, but we still want to make that connection. And that's fine, right? Be upfront. Say, hey, my name is so-and-so. I go to this school. I'm currently studying whatever, or I just started this business on whatever. And I was just wondering if there's a, a tip or a gem or tool that you can give me in my journey, right? Because as an entrepreneur, I like seeing new entrepreneurs come into the space and are eager to learn and are eager to build meaningful connections, right? And I'm sure there are a lot of other entrepreneurs just like that. So they don't mind seeing the person who is in the beginning stages. It might not be of value to me, but just like I was in their spot, right? I wanted to learn from somebody and I'm still in their spot in some in a lot of ways, right? But I'm always in a student mode. I'm already always learning, right? So just like I am trying to get value from someone, I also want to be of value to someone else, even if they have nothing to offer me, right? So like, like I said, just take that initiative and actually just reach out to that person, even if it's not even in person, even if it's through social media, right? Send them a quick DM or message or comment on their story or make a post on, make a comment on one of their posts, right? Engage with that person and actually take the initiative to reach out because you never know who is actually watching you, right? Or or maybe just they're in a the mood in which you're like, hey, like I, I just want to help this person, right? And something amazing can come from that. I would add to that though, you asked for a tip and it just kind of reminds 
reminds me of one of the network groups that I'm affiliated with. I, I mentioned earlier, you can Google it, but I'll do a name drop. There is a brand and they're nationwide and they're called Team Referral Network. And when you register with Team Referral Network, again, you're going to see all these different business owners, these networkers, these professionals. And the hook there is when you join that network, you meet once or you can meet twice a week and that's optional. And they normally have multiple chapters in your city and in your state that you can, they'll recommend like, you know, go to all the chapters of where they're hosting them at different hours or different days. And then you end up finding out about all these other different professionals. And then of course you can ask questions, but their hook there within this team referral network is they say that their job is to make sure that they help people grow their network in a way of referrals. So if someone's starting their own business, whatever that business may be, I don't care if you like trying to do ACs or something like that, right? You're putting in VAC systems inside homes and businesses. You know, you can go there and say, I'm that person. And then their job is to make sure that they think of you whenever somebody they're in need of that particular service. The only way they're going to know that you're in that business is if you go to a network event like so and say, hey, I'm, this is a business that I'm in. Let me know if you guys have any referrals. And, and that's the way they work under Team Referral Network is that they go ahead and they make sure they give referrals. Every event that you show up to, that's just their model. That, that's a tip. You know, you go to Team Referral, Google it, you know, Team Referral Network and you'll find them. I'm glad that you said that because, and if you don't truly know and understand the power of referrals, like word of mouth marketing is the best type of marketing out there, mm -hmm. right? Social media is a close second, but social media is basically just a virtual way of, you know, referring somebody or referring something, right? So it's basically in-person group where you're actually referring people, but it's more targeted because now when you're referring, you're referring, they're either referring you to somebody who needs your services or business or vice versa. So I actually like that. You said team referrals, right? Yeah, team referral network. You can Google them. Yep. And they're, they're nationwide. I like that. I like that. Yeah. So to close out, I just had a couple more questions. So this is more of a selfish question for me. Right. And I hope that my audience can definitely still take advantage of this. But when it comes to real estate, right, I'm looking to get into my first property. But at the same time, I want a multifamily unit that I can, you know, live in and renovate, live in one side and basically have the other side pay for itself. And if you don't know, uh, if, if this is your first time really hearing about multifamily units or you don't really know about it, and Robin can best def definitely tell you better than I can. But in my opinion, I feel like everybody should start off with a multifamily unit if you're going to get your first house, right? Yeah, yeah, I like that. You can live in one. So if you don't know what a multifamily unit is, it's basically a home where multiple families can essentially live in it, right? So duplex, triplex, technically apartment is multifamily. But let's just say... Like I said, this, so this is my question, right? What would be a good way to determine the value of a multifamily unit? And how do I know if that price of the home is like overvalued than what it actually should be? So it, in real estate is, is based off of square footage. And, and so each unit in their square foot, and you, you look at the overall lot size of the, the location, and then when you get into multifamily, you know, when it's like five units or more, it's based off of the per perspective income that you're going to have coming in, which is going to determine the, the the value. So one, you're looking at the square footage, the low key, you're looking at also the location, and then you're looking at how much income you're going to bring in is going to determine the overall value. And then you can look at comparable sales of, you know, other full five units, six unit apartment complexes that are within a mile or two mile radius and what they actually sold for. So if you go, let's say on Redfin or you go on Google and you put in a property address, when this is something that you're interested in buying, whether it's four units, five units, you're going to look at the square footage, right? You're going to look at the how many units that they have available and what is the average rents uh, to rent out each of those units? Because that's what the lenders are going to look at. They're going to look at like, yes, we know that this person can't stay in every unit. They're going to stay in one, mm -hmm. right? And they will be paying a mortgage for the overall apartment complex. But how much income or surplus in income are they going to have based off of those other units? And that's going to determine the value along with the square footage. And then they're going to look at the surrounding apartment complexes and 
what they've actually sold for, then that's how you'll be able to determine the value. Hopefully that answers your question. It makes sense. Yeah, it definitely, definitely did. So just to essentially recap, like I said, it's based Mm -hmm. off the square footage, but it's essentially also based off of where it is, Mm -hmm. what places around it sold similar for in a Mm -hmm. recent, of course, within a recent time frame. Mm -hmm. And what was, I feel like there's one more thing that I'm missing. Yeah. So we talked about rents. We talked about square footage. We talked about location, right? And then we talk about what other comparable sales are. Gotcha. Gotcha. Like I said, that was a that was more of a, a selfish question for me, but I do hope that, of course, that college athletes were able to take advantage of that because, I mean, if you really think about it, a lot of college towns have duplexes and multifamily units close to campus that are actually for sale, and you can still turn. I've seen, especially in Atlanta, I've seen this, so I don't know how it is everywhere else, but I'm pretty sure at least one college town is is similar to this. You can essentially turn one of those older houses that were, you know, that are around the school. You can basically turn each room into its own, you know, basically apartment per se and and have a shared living space. So as a college athlete, if y'all have the money or let's just say you and your friends, you have saved up enough money to actually purchase this. Right. I feel like that might be a good investment for you all because college towns and college living is always going to be something that's especially right next to or close to a campus. That's always going to be something that I feel like is going to be a possible moneymaker because there are always going to be people who need a place to live close to campus. Yeah. You Um, can't go wrong with that. Uh, If I might add, if you have a, let's say like here near USC in Los Angeles, because this is my, you know, my stomping grounds, right. You can buy something for like a million dollars, you know, right there, not too far. And whether it's a residential that you convert into that, or even if it's like a fourplex or fiveplex, you buy for like a million dollars, you can qualify for it under FHA, you know, first time home buyer. And the the mortgage may be like five or six thousand dollars, you know, the the mortgage. FHA is it's first homeowners association loan. Yeah, right. And so if you three point five percent instead of the ten to twenty that you normally have to put down. Yeah, you win it when you buy those. And what happens is if your mortgage is like five or six thousand, like each unit over there is going for like twenty five hundred dollars a month. Dang, twenty five. I was thinking at least two hundred. Two thousand, but twenty five. Yeah, twenty twenty five hundred dollars a month. So you know you gonna splash that and have a surplus in cash flow. So that's the play. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> easy. Know? If it's five rooms, you stay in one. Two of the rooms take care of the rent. The other two is money in your pocket. There you so go. Making five thousand dollars a month just living somewhere. Yep. You win. And eventually, once you leave out of there, you're not living there anymore. Excuse me. You rent out that fifth room. Now you're making seventy five hundred a month passively. That's dope. That's dope. So. Before we close out, is there any like one gem that you want to give to the audience that you feel as if they they could take heed to and actually like take action on right now if they really wanted to? Man, I, you know, I, I love education, man. Like get into, you know, like know exactly what you want to do and, and just go down that rabbit hole of understanding it in and out. Um you know, you can go to any state and and go to the secretary of the state. You don't have to pay an attorney. You don't have to pay legal zoom. You ain't gotta play Robin's your way, you know. You can go to you can go to any state and look up under uh like business entities and you'll be able to start your business there for fifty dollars, you know, twenty five dollars. I think it's a hundred in Georgia, but it's it's still not even that much. So Look, I feel like that's the perfect, perfect gem, right? You said education, but also go start your business, whatever it is, right? Like, like it's not that much to start a business the way people oftentimes think it is. Now, obviously, everything you get afterwards and all the stuff you add on to your business will, you know, that takes time and money. But to just start it, it really doesn't cost that much. And I promise you, even if you were to just go ahead and get your LLC and start your business today, but you really don't get it off the ground until three months, six months, a year, two years from now, little side key, right? A aged LLC is still better than a brand new one because you'll have a better chance of getting higher business funding when you do apply for business. I mean, when, you, when you do apply for your business funding, that's just a little, little quick little hack for y'all, just for those who didn't know. And, and I, and I got to add this, there's, there's startup funds that the government and the states have for these small businesses. You know, we we advocate for the people to educate them on that. So you start some, you got access, whether it's 25, 50K, you can leverage it. And you know what I mean? 
and get all the game that you need. Look, hey, Robin, I appreciate you so much for hopping on and giving the immense amount of value and knowledge. And I, and I just like the fact that you repeatedly over and over and over again highlighted education and learning and learning from people who have already done it. Because I feel like that's the biggest thing uh, there is. Can you go ahead and, like I said, once again, let the people know where they can find you. If they wanted to utilize your services or wanted to ask you questions, where exactly can they find you and what's the best way to get in contact with you? Yeah, you guys can DM me at Robin's Your Way, whether it's on Instagram or on, on TikTok or YouTube, you know, Facebook, we're there. And then, you know, I'm at robinsyourway.com, you know, so you can go there and look at all the services and things that we have and press the contact at robinsyourway.com and then you'll end up at the office. My team will, you know, send you my way and we'll get you guys in shape. I love it. I love it. Hey, well, thank you so much again, Robin and audience for tuning in and listening. Look, if you have any questions for me or for him, you know where to find us. I'll also drop all the links below for you and we'll see you on the next episode. Let's go.